Amen. I just want to make sure that we remember to dismiss the kids. Yeah, family it's Sunday. family Sunday, kids. Have a great time in your classes. And for the rest of y'all, right after service, you can shop on the patio. They'll be here after all three services today. Well, we are going to start a new series just for the month of November. Uh, December 1st, we start Advent, and Advent will be amazing. We're going to have a daily podcast for you just to really prepare our hearts for Christmas. But this month, we really want to focus on learning the art of gratitude, learning to be appreciative, um, because God loves someone who is, is grateful and has gratitude in their hearts. So um, we're going to be in two places today, mainly in Luke. So for those of you who have a paper Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke. Um, but how many of you, anybody absolutely love it when there's like uh, research that is released that proves what the Bible's been saying for 2,000 years, you know? We're over here like, duh, of course gratitude makes you a better person and healthier all around. So uh, a recent study that came out of Harvard, actually there's about 30 studies that came out uh, regarding gratitude and Thanksgiving, found all these amazing health benefits to regularly practicing gratitude in your life. Let me just mention a few of them. Guess what? Depression goes down when you practice regularly, uh, practice gratitude. A review of 70 studies, I correct myself, 40 more than I said, they include more than 26,000 participants found an association between higher levels of gratitude and lower levels of depression. Anybody? Anybody feeling grateful today? Yeah, you're all like, yes, yes, I'm grateful, Lord. How about anxiety? Regularly practicing gratitude can be an effective tool to cope and lessen anxiety in your life. Or how about blood pressure? Anybody got blood pressure issues? One study found that keeping a gratitude journal can cause a significant drop in diastolic blood pressure, but so does eating better. Amen? Okay? So make sure you're eating better, not just giving thanks for what you're eating, okay? It's like two for one. And lastly... There's stress. Stress goes down significantly. Taking a moment to be thankful causes physiological changes in your body that initiate the part of your nervous system that keeps you, uh, that helps you rest and digest. So gratitude and the response causes people's blood pressure to go down, your heart rate to go down, and breathing to help with overall relaxation. How many of you want to take advantage of those awesome, awesome benefits? Now, when we read the Bible, one of the things we are going to learn today is that the lack of gratitude can have a negative effect on your heart. The Bible says it can darken your heart, and it'll lead to self-destruction. You see, gratitude is not just important for our physical health, but for our spiritual health as well. This means that anyone living with ingratitude to the Lord has a darkened heart that will fall deeper and deeper into spiritual darkness. So what good is it if you have great physical health but a darkened heart that will lead you to destruction? So the question I want us to think about today is, how do we avoid growing a darkened heart? Well, the Bible's going to teach us today that those who love God with their whole heart and make a, practic a regular practice of expressing gratitude, those people have brightened spiritual hearts. How many of you want a brightened spiritual heart? I know I do. And so whereas the world, the world might be looking to this research and say, wow, I should really start practicing gratitude. Believers, we don't do it for the health benefits. We do it because it is God's commandment and desire and will for our lives that we would love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And loving God involves expressing our gratitude. And so as we begin this November series, Give Thanks, we're going to take a look at how gratitude and our love for God are expressed through our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. So each week we'll take one of those. Because without gratitude, we cannot love God with our whole selves. Without gratitude, we can't love God with our whole selves. So as we look to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is going to tell us that the greatest commandment is this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So the repeated phrase here in the commandment, the greatest commandment is what? With all 
of your. Why? Because it is possible to love God with only a part of your heart. But God wants us to love him with all of our heart. How many of you want to love God just a little bit? Yeah, I don't think any of you would say, I just want to love God a little bit, you know. Loving God is directly connected with how much, how much gratitude we have in our hearts for him. And so the more we experience, uh, we practice gratitude, the more we can fully love God. Amen? So let's take a look at what I think is the greatest teaching on gratitude that Jesus gave. And we find this in Luke chapter 17, verse 12 to 19. So as we turn there, let me ask you, how well do you regularly express your gratitude to God? How well do you regularly express your gratitude to God? Let us pray. Father, open our eyes, open our ears, but more importantly, God, open our hearts to receive from what you want to put in our hearts this morning, Lord, as we look to the word and to your life, Lord. We want to be people that have brightened hearts, enlightened hearts with gratitude and love for you. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said. So it says this in verse 11, now on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them when he saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is God's word for us this morning. You see, Jesus, Jesus' healing of the ten lepers gives us an example of how highly God values gratitude. Jesus healed ten, but only one returned to give thanks. We find this in verse 15. And it seems to me that Jesus was deeply disappointed when he asked a series of three consecutive questions, parents, you know how to ask a good question. Right? Really? Is that all? Really? Okay. Like, you know that mom or dad are mad or they're disappointed when they just keep asking questions. Jesus goes from 10 to 9 to 1? Like, really? He's deeply disappointed. And dare I say, he's even in disbelief because perhaps nothing disappoints God like an ungrateful heart. An ungrateful heart deeply disappoints God. Furthermore, the Bible specifically records that the thankful leper was not even a Jew. He was not even a, a, an Israelite. He was not part of the people of God. He was a hated Samaritan, a mudblood. You see, the Lord notices those. Those are those who read Harry Potter. Y'all shouldn't be reading that. The Lord notices those who thank him regardless of social, political status, or even level of spirituality. Think about that. Not only that, we learn from this passage that it is often those who think they are closer to God who may have the least gratitude in their hearts. Jews should have been like, wow, God, thank you. Let me bring an offering of gratitude. But it was the hated Samaritan who came back to Jesus and loudly demonstrated his gratitude. You see, God loves grateful hearts, but he is deeply disappointed with ingratitude. This is not a parable. At, at a glance in my memory, I'm like, was that a real story Jesus told or a parable? No, this is a real life story, and it's supposed to shock us. You could almost feel the pain and the disbelief in Jesus' words, in his words, like, how could this be? French writer Jean-Baptiste Massieu, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I just thought I'd take a stab at it. He put it this way, gratitude is a memory of the heart. 
Gratitude is the memory of the heart. Meaning that appreciation comes when you feel grateful from the depths of your heart. When you feel grateful, it's not just a fleeting emotion or an expression of, hey, thanks. It is something deeply ingrained in your heart. Gratitude is a lasting disposition that lingers within you, reminding you of the kindness and grace that you have received from God. Gratitude is a memory of the heart. So how is the memory of your heart doing these days? What are you remembering and lingering and pondering about these days? Consider two Psalms of gratitude. Psalm 9 says this, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of the mo- your name, the Most High. Or how about Psalm 111? I will give thanks to the Lord with what? My whole heart in the company of the upright, in the congregation. You see, indeed, gratitude is the memory of our hearts. So how, how, how is your heart's memory these days? Is it filled with what you were upset and troubled about or with the memory of how good God has been to you? Well, let me propose to you at least four reasons why our hearts can have bad memories. Four reasons our hearts can have bad memories. And if you don't check on them, they will darken your heart and they will kill the gratitude that you're supposed to have in your heart. We turn a little bit to Romans chapter one for this idea. You see, prior to believing in Jesus, the Bible describes people's hearts as darkened. Most of us would not describe our friends and our family members as having darkened hearts, right? Sounds kind of mean, kind of judgmental. We would rather say, oh, my friend, she's such a good person. She doesn't know Jesus, but she's such a good person. She has a good heart. Ah, oh, my tío, mm, he's such a good man. He doesn't know Jesus, but he's a good man, and he's got a good heart. And most of us at their funerals will even believe that they are going to end up in heaven because we'd rather live with that lie than with the reality that those who are far from God have a darkened heart. You see, many of us are functionally universalists. We believe that everyone will eventually end up in heaven, at least all your family and friends. Can we be honest? Many of us are functionally universalists. We believe that everyone will eventually be saved, which means that people don't really need Jesus. But what the Bible teaches us is that ingratitude is a sign of a darkened heart. Listen to what Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says. It says, because although sinners knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became vain in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were what? Darkened. You see, this strengthens the story of the 10 lepers because it tells us that God takes gratitude and ingratitude very seriously. And as long as a person or a culture remains thankful to God, they retain sensitivity for his presence. Gratitude helps you remain sensitive to the presence of God. Thankfulness toward God requires a belief in God. And at the very least, ingratitude fails to fulfill our responsibility to acknowledge God's presence. When we refuse to be thankful or to express gratitude, we grow a darkened and proud heart. We take for granted all that God has given us, and we become our own gods, or we worship lesser gods rather than the one who gave us every single thing in this world. Church, we may not see ingratitude as one of those really bad sins, right? Like how many of you are going to go out there with a sign saying, hey, be grateful, be thankful, or you'll grow a darkened heart? No, we put all the other sins up on a sign, right? As if those are greater, but the Bible says ingratitude is probably more dangerous because it's less obvious that we have it in our heart. It's super obvious if I go to the strip club, but it's not super obvious if I have ingratitude in my heart. Some of y'all just woke up, you're like, what? <laughs> what? Where? What kind of church am I at? 
here are four things that will darken your heart. Four things at least. Number one, complaining. Can somebody say complaining? This is the reason the Israelites did not enter the promised land. Because of their grumbling and their complaining. They wanted the tomatoes from Egypt rather than being in God's presence in the desert. It will keep you out of the blessings God wants to give you. So be careful with your complaining and your grumbling. Number two, entitlement. Some of us suffer from spiritual entitlement. We think we deserve to receive from God because we have behaved well this week, or we've given generously, or we've served above and beyond in 20 different ministries. So when we don't get what we ask for, we grumble and we become ungrateful to God. Jerry Bridges notes that an attitude of entitlement prompts us to grumble about blessings not received instead of being grateful for those we already have received. Entitlement prompts us to grumble (laughs) about blessings not received instead of being grateful for those we have received. But then there are bruises. Some of you are so focused on the bruises of life that you don't see the blessing in the bruises. Let me tell you, I'll get that in a minute. There are blessings in the bruises of life, amen? And the fourth one I would submit to you is forgetfulness. Psalm 103 is all about speaking to yourself to remember how good God has been to you. To say, do not forget how good God has been to you. Why? Because we are so prone to forget how good God has been to us. So those are at least four Four blockages to having a good heart memory. Four blockages to having gratitude in your heart. And guess what? Over time, slowly, Roman tells us that ingratitude not only darkens our hearts, but it takes us to a point of no return, a point of spiritual destruction. So watch your heart closely. Watch your gratitude level. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 2 says this, but mark this. There will be a terrible times in the last days. Half of this room would think we're in the last days, right? There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Can I get an amen, parents? Guess what comes right after? Ungrateful. Ungrateful. Unholy. And it continues. You see, one of the characteristics of people during the time of the end times is the lack of gratitude. You'd think it was like devil worshipers and terrorism and witches practicing dark arts. Nah, man. The characteristic of the end times is ungrateful people. Ingratitude will darken your heart and it will lead to your spiritual downfall. So... Pastor Joel, how do we make sure we don't live like sinners in the last days? How do I make sure my heart is not darkened? It's pretty simple. We need to learn some good spiritual manners, okay? So welcome to Spiritual Manners Class 101, okay? You are all enrolled this morning, okay? And either you pass or fail by the end of this sermon, okay? Alfred Painter, uh, I don't know who that is. I tried to look him up, and all it gave me was Al. Painters named Alfred, okay? So if someone figures it out, please let me know. But Alfred Painter says, saying thank you is more than good manners, it's good spirituality. Saying thank you is more than good manners, it's good spirituality. In other words, expressing gratitude is good spiritual manners. You see, just like learning good manners from your parents, spiritual manners need to be learned from our Father in heaven. Can anyone else relate? But man, I find it hard to receive compliments. Anybody else in the same boat? Just raise your hand. Yeah. I, like, what I usually do is I deflect. That's my number one thing. Like, like Pastor Joel, I love your shirt. I'm like, I love your face. Isn't it true? Kimmy, isn't it true? I say weird stuff like that. I'm just so uncomfortable with receiving. Like, I love your shoes. I love your face or your mustache. I'm like, just take the compliment, man. Someone will compliment me and, you know, they're like, I love your shirt. Or, or, or man, thank you for your preaching. It's, it, was, it touched my heart so much. And I'll, sometimes I'll just say nothing back because I'm like, what do I say? Um, 
I just struggle with it. I need to be taught. I recall Pastor Sean once telling me, Joel, just say thank you and stop making the situation weird. <laughs> That's something that Pastor Sean would do. Stop making, why are you making everything weird? Today I want to teach you some good spiritual manners and how we can express our gratitude to God in some practical ways. First, I think we need to understand that it is God's will for your life to give thanks in all circumstances. Somebody say all. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 19 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And by the way, quench not the spirit. Verse 19. So in our first lesson on learning how to have good spiritual manners, we learn that it is that God's spirit and gratitude are interconnected. I think what Paul is saying is that when we lack gratitude, we put out the fire of God's spirit within us. We darken our hearts. We dim out the light of God. But it also means that when we are filled with the spirit, we exude gratitude. When you're filled with the Spirit, one of the things the Holy Spirit will do, you will exude gratitude. That rhymes. I'm sounding like Pastor Larry up here. So God not only gives us a billion reasons to be thankful, but he gives us his Spirit to then express that gratitude back to him. This is like mind-blowing to me when I read this. How is that even fair? God gives us a billion reasons to be thankful, and then he gives us his Holy Spirit to be able and to be prompted to show him gratitude. God is so kind to us. He's setting up, us up so well to live a life of gratitude, but we still need to be taught. So lesson number one was to understand that it is God's will for your life in all circumstances. Everybody say all one more time. All circumstances. Psalms 100, 4 to 5 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. It doesn't say... Give thanks to the Lord when everything is going well in your life. But isn't that what we do? We only post on social media when we get the thing we wanted or when things are going well, when our kids are obeying us and smiling that one second for at the pumpkin patch, right? And right after, we don't post that. Why do we sanitize our Thanksgiving? It also doesn't say enter his gates when you feel good and when you had a good week. Just enter his gates with thanksgiving if you had a good week. There is no qualifier. Or if you feel led to give thanks. No, it commands us to enter with thanksgiving. So perhaps we need to start practicing this every time we enter our meeting place and our gathering space or when you enter your house or your apartment or your car or your workplace or your classroom, but especially when you enter the doors of the building of God to just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Maybe I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even trip if you were like, thank you, Jesus, out loud coming into this. I wouldn't care as long as you started to practice Gratitude. I make, I make it a habit. It's kind of a weird habit, but every time I get on a plane, because getting on a plane is an act of faith, right? I, 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 right when I cross the threshold into the door, I, I touch the top and I just bless it in Jesus' name and give thanks for it. Half the time I end up with uh, grease in my hands, but it's okay. I say, thank you, Lord, because I'm living by faith right now, Lord. Bless the pilots, Lord God. May there be no crazy people on this plane. Land us safely in Jesus' mighty name. So maybe we need to start giving thanks when we cross thresholds, when we enter into spaces, when I enter into my 20-year-old Honda Accord, Lord God. I say, thank you for this vehicle in Jesus' name. I have to admit, though, I don't always have good spiritual manners. I'm currently in a strange situation living between two places, 60 miles apart, ha apart from my kid for a couple days out of the week because I'm about to fix her up by Jesus' name. 
by his blessing. And guess what? I found myself just on Friday really grumbling about my situation. I'm like, why do I have to be apart from my kids? Why, why can't I afford childcare in this economy, Lord Jesus? Why am I in this situation? And I realized I'm preaching on this on Sunday. I better get it right. And I started turning my grumbling into praise. I didn't have to feel it to practice it. But as I started to say, Lord, Thank you that I even had the opportunity to buy a fixer-upper, Lord. Thank you, God, that, you, that I have a family. Thank you that I have friends that say, stay with us as long as you want, and family that says, stay with us as long as you want. You see, my, my grumbling started to block my vision of God's blessings and my gratitude for what I already had in my hands. How about you? Where is your gratitude being blocked? We are called to thank God in all all circumstances. And I must admit, thanking God in every circumstance is an act of faith, isn't it? Just like getting onto a plane. Thank you, Lord, that this plane ride is going to go well. You're, you're exercising faith because you're saying, God, I'm thanking you for what I don't see yet. God, I'm thanking you, though I don't understand what exactly it is that you're doing. But second is this, that you will not see good until you become thankful You will not see good until you become thankful. You must trust him and say, Lord, I thank you for this situation because I know that you allowed it for my good according to your word and your will. And so when we start to become, uh, to see the good in God and that his desire is to bless and to work every situation, the good The bad and the ugly, Romans 8, 28 says, for, you know, we know that in all things God works for what? For the good of those who love him have been called according to his purposes. So you won't see the good in your situation until you start being thankful and being thankful in advance. It took me 25 years for me to start thanking God for how he used my mother's death to bring about our salvation. I could be fixated on the loss and on the pain, but what God used it, what the enemy meant for evil, God used it for my family's salvation. Not just to bring us to the United States, but for our spiritual salvation. You will not see good until you become thankful. So start practicing gratitude and you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And thirdly, gratitude must be expressed toward God, perhaps even vocalized. Some of you tough guys and tough ladies are not going to like me. Gratitude must be expressed toward God and perhaps even loudly vocalized. What did gratitude look like for the one leper? His gratitude was expressed by returning and falling at Jesus' feet, and it was directed to God. You see, our gratitude can be expressed to people But ultimately, we ought to recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above who is good and who does not shift or change. We give thanks to God for people and for things, but it's always got to be directed to God. We thank God for how he blesses us through people. I wonder if our church was just a little more grateful. Why isn't everybody falling on their feet and on their faces Every time we enter his gates with thanksgiving. See, one of the best places to express our gratitude is when we come to gather as a church. Worship is an expression of gratitude and an exercise of faith. The, next, the text tells us that the leper fell to his face. Let me ask you, when's the last time you fell to your face with gratitude before the Lord? You know, the altars open every single service. You are invited every service to come down here and meet with God. And some of us really do need to learn to posture ourselves in greater reverence and gratitude before the Lord and not just say, I feel it in my heart. Thank you, Lord. You know I'm appreciative. No! No! We need to come back like the leper and say, thank you that you saved me from the pit of hell, Jesus. Thank you for what you did in my family. Thank you that you're changing generations, Lord God. I fall on my face before you, Lord God, not just in my heart, but in my actual life as Isaiah returns. Some of us have this kind of thinking. 
Well, God knows my heart. He knows I'm not an expressive guy or gal. This one's tough for some of you. But if I were to go to like a soccer game or a football game or a basketball game, you're the expressive type. I'm sure it's somewhere in there. You can't just say that. It just ain't me. I would say this. Gratitude is a position of the heart that needs to be expressed outwardly. The other nine lepers may have been thankful in their hearts, but their bodies didn't demonstrate that. Their bodies and their voices didn't demonstrate that they were filled with gratitude to God. You see, gratitude matters to God. What an incredible example we have in this foreign leper. He came back in a loud voice and he fell at Jesus' feet saying, thank you, not quietly in his heart, but loudly. Not with a nod, thanks Jesus, or a wink, but expressing himself with his whole body. You see, we ought to express our praise to God just as loudly as we begged him for that miracle to begin with. If we're not louder than when we were asking for it, maybe we're not truly grateful in our lives. So we should consider when's the last time I expressed my gratitude to God. So church, I invite you, my desire is that our church would be a, a grateful church. A grateful church. That we would be a church that is filled with praise and with gratitude toward God and toward one another because of what God is doing. That, that it would rise up to his nostrils like a beautiful aroma, lest he be disappointed with us. Let us, let, let us express this to God. We can do this because he first loved us. We can love God because he first loved us. We were so undeserving of his goodness, and yet we received it. We can love God with our whole hearts because he helps us to do this by the spirit of God that he gives to live in us. He gave us life. He gave us Jesus. And then he gives us the spirit. What more do we need to fall on our knees and say, thank you, Lord, and praising him in a loud voice? Well, They say practice makes perfect, right? I want you to think of right now of a person that you're just so thankful for. Right now, just close your eyes. Just think of a person that you're just so thankful for. Someone who's living. This is important. I'm going to ask you to pull out your cell phones for one time in church. If you feel led, don't, don't do this because you have to. Just send them a text right now. Say, Lord, put you on my heart. And I just want to thank you and I thank him for you. Something like that. I thank God for having you in my life. Send it whenever you feel led. We're going we're gonna to close with a short refrain from the song, Come Thou Found, which is a prayer asking God to teach us a song of gratitude. Teach us, God, to, to be thankful for what we have and not to forget, not to wander off, Lord God, but to be thankful for him. And so as we sing this refrain in response to what we've heard today, feel free to send that text. Feel free to get on your knees and just say a prayer and show your gratitude to the Lord. No one's gonna judge you if you do something or you don't do something. It's not that kind of church. But I want to encourage us to practice gratitude for someone that we can see and then express it to a God that we cannot see. Would you do that with us? So once you're done, would you stand to your feet and just sing this song with us? Come. Um.
And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you would teach us a new song, a song of gratitude, a song of thanksgiving, Lord, that you would show us how to demonstrate that with people that we see every day, Lord, growing in our gratitude towards you by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because those who love God with their whole heart make a regular practice of expressing gratitude. So, Lord, teach us to love you with our whole hearts, and to grow in gratitude. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Can we give thanks to the Lord this morning?